Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Mahali Aati Mukalme, the dedicated podcast for the Climate and Environment Initiative at RSIL. Today we're joined by Azhar Lahari. Azhar Lahari is a partner at Prime Legal Co. He holds an LLM degree from Duke University and an LLB degree from the Lahore University of Management Sciences. He graduated from Duke University School of Law with Latin honors, cum laude. He also received recognition from the Duke Law School Pro Bono Program and the North Carolina Bar Association for his work with the Environmental Law and Policy Clinic at Duke. He started his legal career primarily as a transactional lawyer and transitioned into litigation after. As a litigator, he's been involved in various constitutional and commercial law matters. In a pro bono matter before the Lahore High Court, he successfully challenged the inaction of the federal and provincial government against climate change leading to the creation of the Climate Change Commission. Thank you for being here with us today. Thank you, Maha. It's a pleasure to be here. So today we'll be talking about climate litigation in Pakistan. And uh, climate change litigation is something that's increased in popularity over the last few years. And just to give an, our audience an idea of the scale at which it's increased, um, between 1986 and 2014, there were just over 800 cases filed in uh, domestic and international courts. Um, across the world, and uh, there have actually been a thousand cases brought in the past six years. So this increase in scale is exponential. Um, and just to start out, I think it would be good to hear what exactly we mean by um, us using the courts as a tool to tackle climate change. Well, um, I think firstly, it's important to sort of just understand what climate change is as a paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. And that's obviously where it becomes relevant uh, in sort of inquiry in terms of what courts can actually do about it. Mm -hmm. So climate change, if you simply view it as the scientific process of greenhouse gas emissions, creating you know, global warming, so on and so forth, then not much of space emerges for the courts to do something yeah. about it. But if you sort of take a step back and you think about a climate change as the product of the world that we've created for ourselves, mm -hmm. um, if it is part of like, a sorry, it, if it is the um, product of our economic, social and political decisions, mm -hmm. um, then it really becomes relevant to sort of see whether we deem courts to be institutions that deal with economic, social and political questions. Mm -hmm. um, for me personally, I think the answer is yes. Courts definitely do, as institutions, deal with economic, political, social questions. And if they do, that is where I'd say the room for courts to deal with uh, climate change as, a, as an issue um, becomes quite relevant. And in that sense, I'd say that um, are courts the ultimatum? Are they the panacea for um, just resolving climate change is an issue. I certainly think that's not the case. Mm -hmm. But they, as institutions, they um, can play a big role. And I mean, you just cited how the numbers have gone up. Um, one part of it, I think, the causality might just be that climate change is becoming more and more pronounced. Mm -hmm. And that's why people just feel the need to go to courts more. But I think um, even generally, just different types of jurisdictions have different, let's just call them strategic toolkits, mm -hmm. enabling courts to sort of, you know, um, deal with climate change in different ways. Now, one way, especially under our constitution, is just the fundamental rights sort of paradigm. Mm -hmm. But um, I've, in my, my time, brief time in the U.S., I saw that, for instance, the North Carolina's con state level constitution has uh, the public trust doctrine sort of just encapsulated in, in three main provisions. And that is in itself enforceable. And I know that at, even in North Carolina, a bunch of um, child petitioners have gone to uh, the relevant body okay. seeking rulemaking. So I think um, all kinds of different courts do have uh, different toolkits to deal with climate change. And I think they definitely can be part of a larger um, strategy to deal with climate change, for mm -hmm. sure. And uh, like on that, I, I read an interesting thing uh, that in the global north, uh, governments are usually um, 
the main actors to deal with climate change. Um, but in the global south where governments are inactive or they don't really focus on environmental issues, then courts really step in. So as opposed to being the last, um, like, uh, the last savior, the last step you go to, sometimes courts will be the first um, place you go to to solve these issues. Well, I, I certainly think that even if we step away from climate change, I think just this um, rights of the marginalized sort of litigation mm -hmm. that climate change also deals with a lot of times, but even other stuff is just a lot more pronounced in the global south. Um, but I, I don't necessarily agree with the idea that, you know, um, courts are not the first place that people will go to in the global north. Um, and I think the reason for that is that it's just that governments, of course, they may have more specialized sort of, you know, just talent, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, to deal with a lot of these issues. But then again, Climate change is the result of our own economic modes of organization, right? Yeah. Extractive economies are resulting in climate change. So if you sort of think about it, I think people go to courts primarily because one judge or three judges or two for that matter are easier to convince than a whole legislature or, you know, so I think just courts are a lot more accessible mm -hmm. here which allows for a lot of you know people to just approach the courts in that sense i think in the global north maybe it might just be that the cost of litigation is also pretty high mm -hmm. which is why you know you have large foundations with a lot of funding mm -hmm. going into um you know these strategic litigations trying to get various rights recognized you know they have a lot of donor funding going on which allows them to do it uh, simply because courts are really expensive. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would say that's a very big reason. Over here, I think courts are just a lot more accessible. You know, you can really... Um, and that's not to say that everyone really has access to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's something I'd like to touch upon as well. The sort of inequalities of just access to justice when it comes to climate change litigation. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think in Pakistan, um, then there's also this more general perception that courts are there to protect the fundamental rights of people. So I'd like to ask you what role you think fundamental rights play in climate change litigation. Is there this link between human rights and climate change? I mean, for sure, right? Like, I think my vice or virtue might be that I tend to look at things a little too much in just hardcore legalistic terms. And I think mm. that just comes with being a litigator. But Fundamental rights are just a way of couching an obligation, right? Mm -hmm. If you want the enforcement of whatever, it may not be a fundamental right, so to speak, but it's an obligation that someone has to fulfill, and that's why you're approaching the court. Mm -hmm. It can be couched as a fundamental right, but at the same time, it's something that can, uh, you know, be, as I was saying in the North Carolinian context, just the public trust doctrine. It's an obligation on the state. It's not necessarily a fundamental right in that sense, mm -hmm. but it's an obligation on the state which permits um, people to sort of just use that framework. So I think fundamental rights is definitely a framework and it really is empowering in that sense. Um, in the context of Pakistan, I think um, our constitution, I mean, it clearly does not in of itself have a right to a clean environment, let's say. Um, which many sub subsequent constitutions do. Yeah. And, you know, that may be an even more potent right. But I think uh, what's really effective about our own sort of just legal framework is that um, the high court's jurisdiction under Article 199 mm -hmm. is just really broad, right? And for that matter, the Supreme Court's jurisdiction under 184 is, you know, just it, like the provision specifically says the court has the power to do justice, mm -hmm. right? Now, the court determines what that means. And in, in its own interpretation, whatever justice requires is something that the court can do. Similarly, in terms of 199, we have the right to life. Now, the, just the jurisdiction under 199, if I may just read, it says, the court can pass an order giving such directions as may be appropriate for the enforcement of any fundamental rights. Now, okay. when it says as may be appropriate, you know, we 
my imagination runs wild, right? What mm-hmm. all can it do? And I think it can practically do anything under the sun so long as it is something that can be tied in with uh, the idea of fundamental rights. And um, in, in that particular context, we have to see that the right to life, I think the first real um, environmental articulation of it was in 1994 in the Shela case, yes. right? Where the court very effectively um, held that just that, you know, the right to life includes the right to lead a quality life, mm-hmm. right? So it's not mere existence or subsistence, right? There's a qualitative element to it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you, you know, just conceive of that, it just becomes so powerful it's, f- to just, you know, articulate any argument um, for in a fundamental rights sort of framework that can just empower so many people if, you know, if you just conceive the argument rightly. That same argument has been used to, you know, uh, I mean, expansively to sort of apply to just clean air, yeah. um, clean drinking water, mm-hmm. and, you know, it, a lot more to come, I guess. And the courts have been favorable to this kind of argumentation as well, which I think is a generally positive thing for the legal community. Um, I mean, not always, I'm sorry, but to an extent. I, 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 I'd, I'd like to also register yeah. my negativity on this as well. It's not mm-hmm. always the case. I think it's it's a big question of just the will mm-hmm. to do it. I think I, I see it as a three-step process. So firstly, of course, there's the will to do it. The second is the legal ability to do it. Mm-hmm. And then the third is just the capacity because it's a te- always going to be a fundamentally technical question. Mm-hmm. So, But I think many um, judges, with all due respect to them, they do end up lacking the will to simply take on such matters, right? Mm-hmm. Like, like, sure, but so what? And I think that also is one of the limitations of climate litigation that we'll discuss in a bit. But first, I'd like to come to um, one of the most cited um, Pakistani climate change cases that there is, um, Lakhari v. Federation of Pakistan. So I wanted to ask you what the thought process was behind filing that claim back in 2015 and what the process was like. So I'll admit that my articulation of it now, mm-hmm. maybe, you know, it's probably well articulated that it's not all that it was back in 2015. I think by repeating it to myself, <laughs> I've just refined the thought process so much that it might seem a lot more clear than it was back then. But um, see, I, I belong to the south of Punjab, right? I, Rahim Al Khan. It's generally a water scarce district. Um, with and my family is in agriculture, so there's a lot of you know, exposure to just agricultural practices and just local communities and what they're facing over there. And um, I just saw something very simple, right? It's, it's you know, a lot of just sugarcane uh, farming goes on there. Sugarcane is a water intensive crop. Mm-hmm. Um, there are about seven to eight sugar mills in about like a 70 kilometer radius, which is just really doesn't make sense to me. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, that's something that I've just always really thought about, right? Like, how can it be that, you know, um, it's a water scarce district. We genuinely have a lack of water there. And the best market is sugar cane, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So individuals will always move to maximize their revenue, right? And, you know, let's not talk about larger farmers, right? But smaller subsistence farmers Mm -hmm. are going to maximize what they can get from their very small land holdings. And if sugarcane is the way to go, they're going to do it. And I I don't think they're wrong in doing it. So there has to be some kind of state intervention or just change of policy Mm -hmm. to provide them with some kind of alternate markets to you know, be able to make a living for themselves, but just have practices that are sort of, you know, not contributing to um, just water scarcity, affecting water security and stuff like that. So in that backdrop, I I don't know, I just started looking into this whole idea of just being water scarce and of course, climate change. And mm-hmm. I'll be honest, that's the first time I genuinely found out that, you know, mitigation in terms of greenhouse gas emissions is not really a Pakistani Concern and it need not be because we're not, you know, we need to be 
you know, just conscious about it. It's not mm-hmm. that if our economy just grows and grows and grows and we should we shouldn't adopt uh, such practices. But it's still the idea that, you know, mitigation is not our primary concern. It's yeah. adaptation. We are disproportionately affected. And that's when I found out all of this. And of course, while looking into it, um, while doing any kind of legal research, you start finding out what the legal landscape is like. Mm-hmm. There wasn't any statute, right? We govern it at we govern the environment at like the environmental protection level, but of course, climate change is a bigger question and because the environment is a provincial subject post the Eighteenth Amendment. Mm-hmm. There's also this question of how do you regulate just trans provincial entities, trans provincial sort of emissions, pollution, so on and so forth. So I realized that there's an implementation framework. Mm-hmm. Um, and while just educating myself, and I'll have to say that the, the, the senior lawyer that I was working with at the, that time has the biggest contribution in all of this because I was pretty young. I was trying to make sense of it, but it was his sort of guidance and just understanding that um, of how we need to structure this mm-hmm. um, because there's a fundamental right and there's a policy mm-hmm. and then the policy has an implementation framework. Um, the question then becomes, how do you get a policy enforced, yeah. right? It's not law. Um, and that's the beauty of, I think, what uh, Mr. Like Justice Mansur Ali Shah did in this case is that um, he came up, in my opinion, with this very ingenious way of getting a policy to be enforced, right? One dimension of that is just creating a commission. But secondly, it's saying, well, the court's not, the court's going to supervise it, but the court's not going to dictate what's going to happen, yeah. right? The government has to make decisions in terms of what measures it wants to take. And we're just going to, you know, hold you to it, to your own representations. Now, just for like clarity, um, there's an implementation frame, sorry, there's a climate change policy of 2012. Yeah. And then there is an implementation framework of 2013, which outlines about 750 odd measures Mm -hmm. that have to be taken by various federal, provincial, governmental departments with respect to all, you know, different water, power, infrastructure, so on and so forth. And those measures are largely, um, you know, so there were priority actions that had to be taken within two years. Mm -hmm. And then there were short term measures, which are five, and then long term measures, which are 10, and then Uh, sorry, medium term, which are 10, and then long term, which is 20. Mm -hmm. So the idea was to just, you know, rather than being prescriptive in drafting the petition, just argue that we have a right and um, throw the, you know, just ball in the courts, court, so (laughs) to speak. (laughs) So that's what we did. And I think um, we got lucky because... We didn't really have to spend too much time convincing the judge that climate change is an issue. Mm -hmm. I think we got lucky because the judge understood it probably a lot better than we did at that time. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, just really caught on to the issue. Just, you know, immediately summoned a number of, um, you know, provincial and federal sort of relevant departments and ministries and just really, you know, got the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. So... The thought process was largely that. And then, of course, it really coincided with uh, the Paris Agreement yeah. as well. Um, it was immediately preceding it. So one argument that we raised was, well, how, I mean, how prepared is uh, the Pakistani delegation for this? Because this is okay. a landmark agreement, um, just just a global you know, innovation that's going to happen right now. Mm-hmm. And if we're not prepared, we shouldn't be signing on to something that really doesn't benefit us in a lot of ways. So um, that was one side of the argument that, that was raised. And I think one success of the petition also was that that argument really helped to speed things up mm-hmm. because the court took that very seriously. Right. So I think in a lot of the comments that would file from hearing to hearing, um, the foreign office really had to just, you know, come and justify and show that it's really taking it seriously and that it's prepared. Um, and, you know, one thing that came out of the case is that it really brought climate change into the administrative vocabulary of the state. Mm-hmm. 
but I'll admit it's not something I'd even conceived of at the time of filing it. Mm-hmm. But it's something that came out of it, and I think it just makes me um, really happy to know that you know I've been able to achieve something like this. But it's also possible, you know. Mm-hmm. Once you realize what's within the realm of possibilities, that's when you really start conceiving of you know what can you do from there. Mm-hmm. So. And especially with something like climate change, where you need institutional change from a lot of different departments, yep. it's really positive that you saw that then, and hopefully we'll see that with the cases that are going on now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, to file this case, did you need to prove standing before the court? So, I think this is a question that we, that I've personally encountered a lot of times, and I sort of, you know, like to say that standing under Article One Ninety Nine. Mm-hmm. is not standing in the sense that let's say like US federal courts sort of you know deal with it they have really strict um like of course it's not statutory but there are these functional requisites that they've created you know mm-hmm. so the court should be able to give the relief that you're seeking there has to be a direct causality and you know a number of these things so US federal court standing is a lot harder to cross as a threshold mm-hmm. and i think I don't know if it's the Juliana case or not, but uh, it's not the Juliana case. But there's um, you know a lot of this big oil climate change sort of litigation in the mm-hmm. U.S. has largely failed because even though the court accepts climate change as an issue, it just sort of disputes the immediate causality of climate change with just big oil, right? Mm-hmm. And I think it's not that it doesn't say there isn't any. It just says quantifying that causality is really hard, right? Yeah. So we're sorry, petitioners, plaintiffs, we cannot grant you the relief that you want. Mm-hmm. Now, for us, standing was not hard because generally it can be any aggrieved person. You okay. know, like if we really just think about it, even not in non-technical terms, how hard is it for um, a person to argue mm-hmm. that you know climate change and the government's inaction? In relation there too is affecting my fundamental right to life, you know, mm-hmm. in effect the quality of life that I enjoy. Um, well, the court really just accepted that argument because it's all the more apparent. And I think as times going on, mm-hmm. as because I think climate change is a slow burning issue. It it's devastating, but it's always largely invisible in a lot of ways because mm-hmm. simply how slow you know it progresses. Um, So as time goes on, certainly it's going to get a lot more easier because the effects will just be so in your face. I hope not, but it seems like that's where we're heading. Yeah. But in my case, I don't think being at a grief party was um, really all that hard. I'll be honest. As a lawyer, I'll say to give me standing, um, just like a semblance of it. Um, we did say that I rely on agriculture as a source of income, which is mm-hmm. true. But uh, as, a, as a funny side story, that just started this narrative that the petitioner is a farmer. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what's been quoted time and time again. Newspapers, and, online, yeah. Yeah, and I think that's a problem, in my opinion, because it really enters this realm of just ex- exoticizing, especially in the global north. By the way, like mm-hmm. I, I, I've met a few people there, even in my short time there, and you know, like once they would realize, like it's you. Oh, we thought it was a farmer, and it's just this. Um, exotic idea of a farmer from you know some really far flung area, just you know going to court, and they just really just glamorize the whole story. Yeah. And I'll be honest, I've really fought that, uh, but a lot of the reporting has really focused on that element. I think it it really takes away a from the real issue, mm-hmm. and then of course it just lies about just access to justice. Like I hope farmers from Rehme Khan. Have that kind of access to justice. Unfortunately, they don't. Mm-hmm. So focusing on that side of the case also really just takes away from what the case is really about and what you know how much of a struggle it was to achieve whatever we managed. Right. So I don't think standing was hard, mm-hmm. but other than that, just you know, um, I'd say creating the argument. And the strategy, of course, has a big um, has a big role. But I think, and this is something that is more personal. Um, it's an observation that I have about the courts, and I think 
a lot of lawyers that engage in pure public interest litigation. Uh, and I think Mansoor Ali Shah uh, Saab also has a judgment where he sort of differentiated between public interest and publicity interest litigation, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a judgment which actually refers to these two terms. I think public interest litigation in a lot of ways has also by, you know, a lot of people, it's looked at, and even judges for that matter, it's it, it's become a pejorative term, mm -hmm. right? People are like, well, public interest is just, you know, you really don't have anything else to do, which is why you're engaging with this. I'm not saying that's true. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying it's, it's a question of perception. Um, over here, it's also the fact that Mr. Mansoor Ravan, who was my senior at the time and who was the primary counsel in this case, um, you know, he's brilliant as an orator. He's a very, very intelligent lawyer, but he's also a very serious practitioner. I mm -hmm. think when serious practitioners bring claims, um, I think courts, in my opinion at least, are a lot more eager uh, and accepting and willing to deal with those matters because mm -hmm. they just don't think it's something, you know, someone's doing because they have a lot of free time on their hands. They just think it's a pressing issue. So I think that's something I'd definitely want to be out there. Yeah. Um, you know, all issues are serious, mm -hmm. but I think it's just, unfortunately, uh, who the advocates are make a big difference in the court system. And I think that did definitely play a big role here as well. Which I would say ties in with your original question. I don't think standing was really hard to prove because it just, you know, it just seems like a, a very serious petition. So, so long as the court knew, um, and of course, sorry, I'd also say that um, public interest litigation, I think the legal requirement is, you know, it needs to be just, you know, not publicity interest and in good faith. Mm -hmm. So long as the court was convinced that that's the case then just tying right to life uh, with climate change and government inaction is not really a very hard thing to do. Um, if we change the nature of the claim, let's suppose this was a case for damages, hmm. I think standing would have been a lot harder to prove. Um, but just, you know, getting the government to do something in terms of Article 199 is not, I don't think it's a hard case to make. Mm -hmm. And within the um, <clears throat> original claim, was did you specify exactly what um, uh, you wanted the government to do? Or um, was it just left up to the court to decide that? Um, I mean, it, it was definitely left up to the court, mm -hmm. right? The, the idea was um, we, we just highlighted a problem, yeah. showed a lot of just figures in terms of, you know, water scarcity, um, our per capita water usage being really high number of other climate related problems just highlighting that you know climate refugees are becoming a real thing yeah. you know just highlighting just making a compelling case and then drawing out that there's a climate change policy um so the government had to you know take whatever measures it did within a period of two years mm -hmm. so the petition was filed immediately close to the deadline for the priority actions okay so the, the petition essentially said, well, this is a very, really big issue. It's clear that the government's not doing anything. Mm -hmm. We just want to know what the government has done, right? Mm -hmm. So that was our simple case. And, and I think as a strategy, uh, and this is more an afterthought. I'd like to think that I knew this at the time, but I really didn't. Um, throwing the ball towards the court is really effective. Because you're giving the court the freedom to appreciate the issue and then think about what all they'll do. I mean, I think if we had gone with a specific prayer, maybe the commission would not have come about. Um, I think that is the case, right? So the commission, I think, is solely uh, Justice Mansoor Ali Shah's genius mm -hmm. uh, playing out. He made the commission, got the right mix of members from the government civil society, uh, to be honest, a few certain people who he knew were individuals that could really just, you know, nudge people and really get them to work. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it, it's open to keep, it's better to keep it open-ended because it really allows the court to, in effect, uh, do what the court feels right, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and you cannot be too prescriptive anyway. And that's something I'd like to discuss in due course that, Climate change is too technical 
for um, you know you to have a preconceived idea of what your what relief you want, and even sort of you know because the court is gonna in a lot of cases just call in uh, technical experts and try developing whatever understanding it can of it, and then think about what it can do. Right. So I think it's better to leave it broad, and that's what we did as well. Mm-hmm. And you've kind of um, mentioned your opinions on the climate change uh, committee, but this is a a tactic that the court uses quite often in environmental cases, like to form a committee to then determine how to deal with um, an issue like, for example, the salt mines case. Um, So do you view that as um, an effective tool? Oh, certainly. I think because, see, you have to appreciate that under Article 199, the court uh, is not a fact-finding mm-hmm. body, right? It, it it cannot lead evidence. None of that's going to happen, which is, I think, good because then, you know, a lot of time is saved. But these commissions, um, you know, you get to bring in a lot of, you know, technical experts from various walks of life, uh, various stakeholders, and they can really just sit down and, you know, provide their technical expertise in in the form of a commission and then come up with recommendations. I'd also like to talk about its limitations. I don't think it's a substitute for just robust policymaking generally, Mm -hmm. but I think it it, it is really effective when you think about um, just, you know, getting the ball rolling or getting some substantive baseline steps to, you know, steer things in the right direction, right? So... The court, of course, is used, I think, commissions in a number of cases. Um, and Dr. Pervez Hassan, I think, is the one individual who's probably headed 95% of those commissions, if not more. Um, and it's always, uh, you know, led to some kind of tangible results, which I think um, make them a very potent, um, you know, option. Mm-hmm. But I think especially when it came to the climate change commission it was really i think it went it 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 went to a whole new level mm-hmm. because there were so many stakeholders from all different walks of life then there were uh committees with you know subcommittees one on water one on you know just energy so on and so forth and each one of them would come up with their own recommendations it would give its own sort of priority actions they would you know just have these back and forth but with all kinds of bureaucracy, I think there's always the limitation as well, right? Sometimes things get lost in presentations. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just one presentation after another. And the question is, what is it really achieving? Um, and of course, that's something I really think about in terms of this case as well. Mm-hmm. Um, there, were, there were a lot of recommendations that the committee gave. Many of them were implemented. I think there were a number of things that were also expedited simply because the commission was functioning and because the court had issued a continuing mandamus, which meant that the court was acting as the supervisory body. Just, you know, so, I mean, I think what I appreciate a lot about uh, just Shah's approach is that he became sort of the supervising body, but he really let the technical people make their decisions. Mm -hmm. And he's like, let me know where I can help. I think one very particular uh, instance that I can quote is, you know, there was, I I think it it related to the water policy and it being approved. Um, And of course, the commission actually managed to get a water policy draft out there and get it approved, which was, I think, a very big thing because it wouldn't have come about otherwise because it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't something that people were thinking about. But what managed to what what the court managed to do was that um the council of common interests was just in, what just wasn't you know uh meeting it what it hadn't met in a long time it was a constitutional body but you know just really not functioning at all and you know because the cci had to meet and approve the policy under the law mm-hmm. um of course justice shah immediately issued directions and i and i remember that um, it, it was funny because the constitutional provision says shall meet um, at least once every 90 days or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the government's lawyer said, well, my Lord, they're supposed to meet after 90 days. And he said, no, 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 it says 
at least every 90 days. There's no prohibition on them meeting earlier. Mm -hmm. So I'm just, you know, issuing a direction that a meeting be convened in the coming week and just, you know, get this through. So it really ends up expediting a lot of things that would be caught, you know, within this sort of uh, government bureaucracy, red tape, and just, you know. But I think the limitations also are that the bureaucracy, especially, I mean, I think civil society gets really excited about these commissions because mm -hmm. it's their chance to really contribute to some kind of policy making. Amongst other ways, this is, I think, something really effective for them. I think the bureaucracy gets really annoyed at beyond a certain point because mm -hmm. they feel like, you know, the court's really just coming into our domain. But of course, they're also bound to do what the court says. Mm -hmm. But just these, you know, uh, endless meetings really frustrate them also. And, you know, I'll be honest, um, a number of, you know, members of the bureaucracy from various departments, once the commission had gone on for a very long time, they used to come to me and say, well, why don't you tell the court you're satisfied now? So, you know, this can end because we have to come to Lahore, you know, every two weeks and, you know, attend two meetings and just, you know, really deal with this. And then whenever there's a hearing, we have to be here again. So our general work is really getting affected as well. So I think commissions um, do serve a purpose. You just really need to know their um, limitations as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where you can really effectively utilize them. Um, but as I said about courts, I think the same applies to commissions. It's not a panacea that's just going to you know, solve everything. Mm -hmm. But where fact-finding is required, um, it's a very effective you know, way to just get everything together and get things moving. Mm -hmm. And so since the Lahari case, we've seen a lot more cases being filed in Pakistan. There's uh, Maria Khan, there's Rabab Ali. Um, and so, like, based on what you're saying, perhaps it's not the best thing for us to have more cases, but um, maybe just directing towards the right things, right? We can't have an infinite number of commissions. Um, yeah. no, but, what, but what makes you say, based on what I'm saying, cases are not the best way? No, I think the cases are good, but perhaps we don't need 100 cases. Perhaps we can have um, a couple of cases that touch on different points that um, get across the action that we need. Um, because we don't want to get caught up in this um, bureaucracy of it, right? Even our court cases are a couple of years long, at the very least. And um, each of them should not have their own commissions that increase the amount of work for public servants. We should really be looking at it strategically. Yeah, I think there has to be, uh, and I think you've articulated it really well, it's a question of strategy, right? You have to see what we want to achieve in whatever period of time, and then see what's most effective, right? Um, if you think that the courts fall in to the strategy, good, right? Um, they can be really effective tools. But they're not a substitute for policy making, right? I, like, mm -hmm. if we move beyond simply just this idea of climate change, but talk about just, you know, otherwise environmental matters, um, things are not going to change if we don't change our sort of, you know, uh, way of life, right? Mm -hmm. Just this idea of how we organize ourselves economically. I think the COVID pandemic did at some level, you know, force us to reimagine a few things. But I just feel like it's just then again, once things are again normalizing, we're also losing that. So with cases, um, I think just know really clearly what you want. Um, I think hundreds of cases will be filed nonetheless. Mm -hmm. um, but the issue with most of those cases is that there's no clear strategy in terms of what you want to achieve, right? You really have to clearly articulate um, what you want, right? I mean, I think, for instance, um, a lot of the litigation in the U.S. is being done by this organization, I think, called the Our, Our Children's Trust. Mm -hmm. And they're just filing a number of these cases at different levels, all arguing the public trust doctrine. I think North Carolina is just one of them. They've done one at the federal level, which, yeah, the Juliana case is that one. There are a number of other cases, and all of them are making the same argument, right? Mm -hmm. um, we need, like the public trust doctrine dictates that the government needs to protect resources for 
future generations. Now, the framework is this sort of intergenerational equity. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we couch that in fundamental rights terms. So the right to life means there should be intergenerational equity. Yeah. But it's a standalone concept that you can also invoke. So you just really need to know what you're going for, right? Um, I think as a litigator, my issue then again might just be that I really think about things in a very specific sense. Mm -hmm. There's no generalized response to it because an effective case um, will be one which has a very particular issue and you devise a strategy. So as far as I'm concerned, I think I really think that courts are effective mm -hmm. and filing the right kind of case um, with the right argument and with the right degree of seriousness uh, and just hard work. Because one thing I think I missed out on saying, you really have to be dedicated to your case then because you know there will be times when the court if it really believes in your argument, it's going to, you know, hear the case for days at end, right? It'll be like, mm -hmm. you go to court on Monday, they'll be like, sure, okay, come back on Tuesday now again, because, you know, another department's going to respond, then they're going to give you a two-day break and call you on Friday. So it takes a lot of, it consumes time as well. So the cases which have the right strategy in relation to the issue mm -hmm. and people dedicate their time, I think a lot can be achieved. Um, but it's always going to have its larger limitations, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And um, I think part of the larger limitations are also how the public views um, judges who are broadly construing certain doctrines. So there's always this fear, I think, um, that the public could have towards um, judges who are very accepting uh, towards environmental arguments. So they're worried about judicial activism and judges going outside their mandate. So is that something that you think is a limitation in Pakistan? Oh, I mean, for sure, right? Like, I think we have really um, clear examples of when mm -hmm. that has happened, right? So I think um, the issue in that sense is, well, I think I'll come out and say it, right? Um, a court actually tried crowdfunding a mega yes, infrastructure yeah. project. It is downright absurd, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, if you think about it in those terms, well, of course, it really harms the credibility of the institution. Um, and of course, like you know, we're never really going to know the true extent of it. We're never going to really going to know the facts. And there's, of course, a lot of propaganda. Maybe a lot of money was, you know. Like maybe they actually did manage to get a lot of funding, but it really ended up politicizing the court um, in a very negative way, right? So I think that's on the judges. They really need to be careful in terms of how they're receiving the argument, what kinds of directions they're giving, right? Mm -hmm. um, like, I think then again, that brings me back to appreciating Justice Shah because he was very clear, right, from the very start, and I remember him saying this, where you know, this was to one uh, member of the bureaucracy, he said, we're not going to run the government for you, mm -hmm. but we're not going to let you just sit around. And I think that's a good way, and I, and I would, I mean, I haven't spoken to him about it ever, but if, if I had to guess, I think he was specifically, uh, he said this because he wanted it to be very clear that we're not going to, you know, overreach. Mm -hmm. We want to limit ourselves as the judiciary, but in a, in, in, in a question that touches, you know, just existential issues, existential crises, um, we're not going to sit back and let, not let you do anything. Mm -hmm. I think one of the funniest memories that I have of the case is uh, because we have to appreciate where it started from, right? On the first date of hearing, we made our submissions, the court issued notices, the next hearing, the food department uh, representative came and the court just asked him, uh, well, you know, whoever from the food department, what is your understanding of climate change? Um, and he says, that doesn't relate to us. And he's like, right. why not? And though, because we, our main job is to procure wheat. Mm -hmm. That's it. And well, he goes, well, what if there's a wheat shortage, you know? The court asked this and he goes, well, we can always import more. 
And, you know, it's just this idea of not being able to see what climate change was. Mm -hmm. So I think what the court did really well was it said, well, it's your domain. We're just telling you, we're identifying a problem for you, right? Food security is heavily tied in with the larger climate change paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. It is the food department's job to understand that there will be food shortages as a result of this. Yeah. We're not going to dictate what you need to do. We're just telling you, you need to be aware of this issue. And I think that is where um, they're accepting of that direction from the court. But, you know, if, if the courts just become too active, um, you know, and there, there are a lot of times, you know, courts also, like a lot of judges have the tendency to, so become larger than life and really start scolding people. Of course, right? Like that's where courts just, you know, start creating bad names for themselves. Um, so long as that's not happening. But I think that is on the judge. I think judges themselves need to be conscious of really carefully treading their lines in that sense. Mm -hmm. And especially when it comes to <coughs> something as technical as climate change, um, because it's very hard for you to, as a judge, be able to dictate. Actually, it's not your place at all to dictate exactly what policy needs to be in place. That's something for expert ministries and the government to do. But see, I think, sure, I, I take your point 100%. But adding on to that, I think a lot of the times, even people from within those expert ministries will, you know, just give the court advice that is not sound right so i think the lahore high court is uh there's another continuing mandamus case where it started with like you know just the subsurface water level in in punjab and lahore particularly but it's grown up grown into a lot more and um this sort of direction to get um m tag registrations for all cars that have to go on we have to travel on the motorway. Mm -hmm. My understanding is, is that it was pursuant to a direction by the high court. My understanding is that the direction was given because the relevant officer just said, well, a lot of the smog contribution comes from cars idling at uh, toll plazas. Mm. It really doesn't make sense. But immediately after that direction was given, I already had an MTAG, but I was traveling to Islamabad once and I saw that there were just Cars and cars and cars parked everywhere for, you know, on that day. But I, I, I understand that it went on for weeks. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're not really solving the problem because now cars are idling at the, you know, MTAG issuance booth. Mm -hmm. And it's really not making much of a difference. And a lot of these measures just, you know, they, they don't make sense in a lot of ways as well. So I think... At the end of the day, it is it is really the, the government's domain. Mm -hmm. Where you think they're really going wrong, that's where you step in. But I think, um, and I think like another area that I, I think I'd, I'd like to comment on is we have to also appreciate that courts are largely counter-majoritarian mm -hmm. as an institution. So probably the most effective thing is going to be, well, you... When you're fighting for the rights of the most marginalized, that's where courts can really become effective. Because mm -hmm. these people are not, not going to get you know, relief anywhere else. But other than that, I think courts also need to think about what they can do and what they can do really, really clearly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then also there needs to be um, capacity building within the legal fraternity, within courts, um, just within the country in general about the threat of climate change and the fact that we need to act very quickly to address it. Um, and in my mind, at least, that's one of the ways we can um, start plugging these limitations yeah. um, and perhaps get more um, action on climate change. Oh, certainly. So um, I think an interesting sort of anecdote is that um, following this case, um, the Lahore High Court actually ended up organizing a green workshop at the Punjab Judicial Academy okay. where they called in um, all of the environmental magistrates from Punjab mm -hmm. and all of the tribunal members of the environmental tribunal as well. And uh, I had the good fortune of also being part of the training workshop where we created this environmental handbook mm -hmm. 
-hmm. just you know uh, just you know sort of expounding what the law is but also giving them like citations in terms of you know what an aggrieved party is when you can really just you know so giving them a lot of ammunition to deal with climate change matters um and it was it was fun also it was a good exercise because we also ended up creating like fact p- patterns and mm-hmm. like you know the judges were actually teamed up and they had to undergo a moot problem as well um and this was you know they thought this was going to be like a biannual thing um and only one workshop happened so there's also a problem in terms of you know um judges have a lot more to do as well right dockets are burdened um i think part of the bourbon declaration is that we've asked for a green bench mm-hmm. um and we have one a permanent green bench in the lahore high court um which deals with all big environmental matters that are filed before it but dedicated green courts are also a thing um but i think just d- judges have their dockets really burdened by so much other so many other things that you know they also lose track and focus so i think the issue with climate change then again is it's something that is so slow burning yeah. and someone who's filed this petition i can you know it's it's, it's also self reflection where i can say do i always think about this issue no like you know, mm-hmm. they co- they do come you know months where it's not something i'm actively thinking about it's something i understand but i think that problem also happens so you're right to say that um you need uh capacity building and that's going to happen if there's a larger you know policy in place and there is none right so i think a lot of this was driven by justice shah and then justice ashfa malik right after mm-hmm. i think now uh, justice jawad hassan and justice shahid kareem are the two primary judges that deal with uh you know environmental matters but there has to be a larger policy because a lot of cases just get decided without even people realizing well there was a climate an- angle to this mm-hmm. you know a lot of infrastructure projects so i think one of the really good things that the commission did was that it created this project assessment matrix where okay. they developed this you know like different parameters where you had to judge the climate smartness of a project mm-hmm. um now that's something that was given to the bureaucracy and said well you're going to implement this it's not something every judge knows about or you know most people know about mm-hmm. so a lot of the cases will just go by without the judge even asking well oh i think there's a climate change matrix that you have to comply with well so it's stuff like that i think there has to be codified po- law or at least larger policy which is more part of our everyday conversation for there to be capacity building otherwise you're just going to do like a one off thing mm-hmm. and then forget about it um and that's always good to take pictures and you know just yeah. create some hoo-ha about it but it's not substantially achieving much and i think this is an issue which requires our undying efforts on a you know like very fundamental basis there's a lot that we need to change right i i don't think and i i mean to be honest like um i wouldn't be surprised if we haven't met most of our short term goals and mind you um 2023 is approaching yeah. so the 10 year uh, medium term actions mark is almost here mm-hmm. but i don't think we're done with even our short term actions in a lot of ways so yeah i think a larger policy needs to be in place i don't think the climate change policy is even cutting it anymore mm-hmm. yeah and hopefully we will see more action on that in the future um especially with the um obligations that we've agreed to at the glasgow summit and hopefully this year as well in egypt um the pakistan delegations may be more ambitious and let's hope that that translates into implementation on the ground in Pakistan as well. I mean certainly um but the question really is what those obligations are right and mm-hmm. what dimension they relate to I think our main concern will always be mitigation and for that there has to be a lot of you know uh, I mean there are lo- words going around that we're generally 
broke as a country anyway. Mm -hmm. But um, a lot of specific funding needs to go into that element, right? Um, I think food security is a big problem. I don't think too many climate resistant agricultural practices or research in seeds is happening. And the issue is this is not something that's going to be solved over a year, two or three, yeah. right? Um, developing seeds, for instance, is a really big um, like commitment, right? It takes years and years of research to actually develop something along those lines. And if we think about it, like I know for a fact that um, it's almost mango season now and the mango crop has been affected at least 30 to 35%. Mm -hmm. um, of fruits have just, you know, they've dropped and they're, 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 they've been wasted simply because the temperature variation in the short period of time is too high for them to really, uh, you know, convert into proper full-grown fruits. Mm -hmm. So I think I'm still a bit skeptical. I really hope more people come out and do something about it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm, Skeptical to say at least. Understandable. Yeah. But um, thank you so much for this very, thank you. very this was, insightful discussion. Yeah, this was wonderful. Thank you for having me over. And um, thank you to the audience for watching. Please tune in for our next podcast as well.